one person that I was talking to back a few years ago made the comment of beekeeping being literally livestock, livestock management. And I think that's really an apt, apt way to describe it. Uh, let's see here. So before I get any deeper, I do want to do a couple of plugs for some educational material. And ironically, I don't get any kickback on this. I, I probably should, but no. Uh, American Bee Journal, if you have not, uh, I think it's $28 for a year. I think they give you a little bit of a break if you sign up for a couple of years, two, three years. This is really an incredible resource. Um, comes out monthly, American Bee Journal. This is the September edition. I've had a chance to read like one page out of it. Uh, just but I'm actually wanting to sit down the next couple of days and go through it. Great information. A really interesting new book that just came out, uh, Russian Honeybees by Stephen Coy, C-O-Y. Um, one of the biggest things, biggest things that we are facing in beekeeping, um, if you put this word at the top of your notes and underline it, highlight it, draw arrows pointing to it, it will help you with 90 to probably 95% of what is necessary to make sure your beekeeping is successful. And that one word is mites. Mites. I get tired of hearing myself say it, but mites, mites, mites. Varroa mites is really where the vast majority of our problems are coming from. I, um, uh, almost all of the, almost all of the issues we deal with are oftentimes an issue that have, that has come into the colony because the colony's health has been already affected by mites and just being at a threshold that they shouldn't be at. Uh, Russian honeybees, interestingly enough, seem to have a, and I, I just, I think I've, I've gotten a chapter two of this book. Russian honeybees have some really interesting characteristics that allow them to be tolerant to mites. They still have them, but they seem to be able to have a tolerance of kind of somewhat coexisting with them. And so for those of us who, I mean, it, it's a matter of time of when some of the treatment methods that we're using for mites that the mites are going to develop a tolerance or develop a resistance. We've seen that uh, because the reproductive cycle of the mites is so quick, uh, it allows them to mutate genetically or build tolerances genetically much quicker than something that does not have as quick of a reproductive cycle. And it's also because of that quick reproductive cycle that they can explode in your colony and take it down before you know it. Uh, two more books here that I'll mention. So that was Russian Honeybees by Stephen Coy. The other one is Honey Farming by R.O.B. Manley. Let's see. My fancy background there is bleeding into the... Uh, this is such a... I think the book came out in the late 70s. But this is the thing, is that... Even, the big thing that's changed in beekeeping in the last 20 years is once again the issues that stem from mites. So the, the principles as far as your colony management, as far as you know, splitting bees, as far as keeping uh, uh, good longevity or a, uh, a good laying queen, uh, just the basics of beekeeping really have not changed. And so these are just, that's an excellent book. And also lastly, this was a really cool, cool book, Bees in America. And it's actually a history of honeybees here in the United States. And that is by Tammy Horn, H-O-R-N. Uh, this is some really great Bees in America, how the honeybee shaped a nation. It's really cool to see actually how integral honeybees have been in our country from really its inception, it's really fascinating. So, okay, where's my, uh, my notes here, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this time of year, what we have been focusing on, uh, just to kind of give you a quick breakdown, 
end of July, while we still had a little bit of a honey flow going on, we, we pulled our honey supers. Um, the reason that we did that was twofold. I wanted to get an early start on mite treatment. And secondly, what was my second brilliant point? I wanted to get a gym on mite treatments. Oh yeah, there was. And the secondly too, was I was wanting to experiment a bit with them having their own honey utilized. So we break all of our colonies down into two deeps, two deep uh, supers. I wanted to see what are the uh, what are the effects on colony health if we've got our mites under control. That's the main thing, mites under control. What is the effect of that colony? We're still having to feed syrup to make sure that they get up to a good wintering weight. Well, what's the effect going to be on the overall health of those bees if they have natural forage in those double deeps that they're continuing to bring in uh, into the supers that they're going to be wintering in? Um, so we did that. We started our mite treatment. Interestingly enough, and here again is a really interesting visual Let's see if this works here. I'm going to try to share this picture. Let's see. Does that work? Hopefully you guys can see this picture. Uh, this is a sticky board. This is a sticky board. Uh, and what we did was after we had done our full round of treatments using Amitraz or Apivar, I went to two colonies in every yard and put a sticky board underneath or on the bottom board, put another dose of Amitraz on top and came back 48 hours later to see whether there was still mite drop. And as you can see, just in this small area, I don't know if you can see, well, you see where my finger is. I mean, there's three mites in that square. Uh, there's just, there, there's more mites that, and that was a pretty consistent spread across the whole sticky board. Uh, was, you know, like two or three mites per square. And even in this picture, you can more or less see at least one to two mites per square. If we were going solely off of the way that the, uh, uh, that the bees looked, we would, we would be screwed. I mean, we would not, because uh, our, our bees right now look absolutely awesome. They look excellent. Uh, the vast majority of them, because we called heavily on weak hives uh, two, three weeks ago, the vast majority of them are two boxes of bees absolutely jam-packed. I mean, just jam-packed with bees looking beautiful. But, and this is actually the uh, gentleman I was talking to in North Dakota, I was getting his, his opinion on this, as I said, you know, how is it that we did a full round of mite treatment and I'm still seeing heavy mite loads like this. This happened to us last year as well. And so I, I was kind of expecting it. And that's why I went and did the uh, test with the sticky boards. And he said that when you have heavier populations, when there's more volume of bees, oftentimes it's more difficult to get the same effective kill in a treatment, which I mean, that makes sense. So we actually started this uh, last Wednesday and we're gonna do another full round of mite treatment. So it just reiterates again, just the importance of just staying on top of mites. Uh, so if you're listening to this and maybe you haven't done a mite treatment yet, uh, there's still time, even though it is getting really late, uh, go out tomorrow, go out tonight while you're watching this, go on Amazon, Man Lake. Uh, we have local suppliers, Wood Bee Company, uh, Beeline, Woodenware, and Apiary here in Rochester, uh, and get a get a mite treatment, get it in that hive, and get those mites knocked down. The reason that treating mites this time of year is so so important is that you're dealing with the brood that is being infested with mites right now is what's going to make up the bees for the winter cluster. And so if you have a high mite load now, uh, the viral issues that those mites transmit are going to be given to those larvae that are going to be your winter bees. And so their immunity and their health is already going to be compromised. 
so that's why oftentimes people will see their colonies fail either around like November or October sometimes when we get that first good cold snap or they'll see their colonies make it into you know February, March and then collapse. Uh, almost always that has to do with mite loads and so just just make sure so mites mites that's the big thing the other thing is feeding and nutrition um, right now you want to be focusing on feeding your bees at least a two to one two part sugar to one part uh, water syrup or even a uh, uh, what we've been feeding obviously just for efficiency for us and our operation is a mixture of two to one syrup and then also uh, uh, HFCS 55, which we actually buy up in Seattle at the Cargill plant, which is a mixture of 55% high fructose corn syrup and then the other percentage is a mixture of glucose and sucrose. It's a very heavy syrup. The reason you're wanting to feed your bees a really heavy syrup this time of year is because they don't have as much time now, obviously, as they did in the summer to evaporate the extra moisture necessary to cure that honey or cure that nectar. Um, that's where a lot of people run into moisture issues in their colony. A lot of the times, some of the times it can be due to ventilation issues. But a lot of the times it has to do with us getting around this time of the year <laughs> and they may have forgotten they had a hive or two of bees in their backyard and we get a cold snap and all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, I need to feed my bees. And so they go out and, you know, they'll, they'll feed their bees syrup, a one-to-one -one mixture or whatever else. And if the weather has already started to turn cold, if it's in the 50s, uh, you know, even low 60s, uh, the bees have to work all that much harder to bring the moisture content of that nectar down so that it stays, so that it doesn't ferment on them. So really, uh, I think it's the last time I looked at the forecast, there's like a week and a half, two weeks of weather in the 70s, 80s, and that's awesome. For us, that is, that is good news. It uh, gives us a chance to uh, fatten up or, or get good weight on our lighter colonies. The, uh, the weight that you're looking for for a single, if you're gonna winter in a single deep, you're wanting to aim for around 80 pounds total, 75, 80 pounds. For doubles, 100 to 110 pounds uh, is, is definitely your minimum of what you're wanting to aim for. The other part of the nutrition that's really important is pollen, pollen substitute. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me because they've heard or they've, they've read that giving your bees pollen substitute this time of year can be a negative because it may stimulate brood rearing and you're going to have a bunch of energy being focused into, into, into brood rearing instead of um, wintering or they're afraid about having too many bees going into the winter and how that's going to burn through food or burn through stores. If you're feeding a good quality uh, pollen substitute, it is most likely going to stimulate brood rearing. If the, uh, if the protein content of the uh, pollen sub is really above, I think it's 18% or so, uh, it's going to end up stimulating brood rearing to a certain extent. But more importantly, what you're doing by giving them pollen sub this time of the year is you're allowing, once again, those bees that maybe are currently larvae or getting ready to hatch or are hatching, those bees that are going to make up the winter cluster, they need to put on fat stores. Uh, Randy Oliver, and here I'm going to try and, and share this uh, Share this page here, Fat Bees, Randy Oliver. Uh, Randy Oliver has this, I think it's a, it's a three-part series. Let's see, share this. Da, da, da. Where, oh, where am I? Here we go. Uh, has a three-part series on Fat Bees. 
<laughs> and, you know, a lot of us, when we think of fat, think of a negative thing. I, I know when I think of fat, I think about the bacon that I uh, have to quality control at our restaurant, Mills Diner, and how it suddenly appears around my waist. It's the most amazing thing. But fat really is an important component in any kind of living organism. And it's the same thing with bees. And so Randy Oliver, scientificbeekeeping.com, he is a wealth, an absolute wealth of information. And he goes into detail of why it is so important to make sure that your bees have a good protein source. And also, and a protein source that is, is complete. People have asked me about, you know, whether I make my own pollen substitute. And in my mind, it would be like me trying to fashion my own multivitamin. Um, yeah, I can do it, but there's people who have devoted their entire lives, or at least substantial amounts of the years, perfecting these pollen substitutes. And for me, I'd much rather rely on their expertise and on the time that they have spent uh, developing and you know doing all the research and development for that. The uh, pollen substitute that I use is called Nutra B, uh, N-U-T-R-A-B, B-E-E. -E. Um, now it's kind of cruel for me to give that information because the gentleman that makes it only sells it by the 2,000 pound pallet. I have gotten his permission on reselling it. I just haven't figured out because it comes in 50 pound blocks. I haven't figured out yet how to practically offer do that, but I'm, I'll try to do that at some point in the future. Um, but there's some really, really good pollen substitutes on Man Lake. Uh, there's Ultra B, there's uh, B Pro, I believe. Um, Dayton, well, both Dayton and Man Lake have a pollen patty that is formulated for winter, uh, that is lower on protein, but high on carbs. Um, so really, uh, all I would suggest is just get the preformed patties, um, buy, you know, buy a package of it if you have some friends uh, that are in the area or even a bee club, you know, see whether there isn't a way of, of uh, buying a package and splitting it, you know, among the members. Uh, on average, you know, a, a pollen patty is what, maybe two or three dollars, but it's incredibly important in making sure that your bees have the nutrition that they need to set them up successfully. So, so far, big thing you want to have, in order to set yourself up for wintering success, quick recap, you want to have any honey pulled that you, that you want to consume yourself. Pull it off the hive, treat for mites, get that treatment done, and then at the same time, you're wanting to make sure that you're feeding them a thick syrup at least a two to one syrup so that they're putting on good weight, 75 to 80 pounds for a single colony, 100 to 110 pounds for a double colony. And you're also wanting to make sure that you're giving them a good quality pollen substitute. And there's lots out there. Um, if you have access to natural pollen, to a natural pollen, uh, that's obviously king, but, uh, it can kind of be expensive depending on the source of it. It can sometimes harbor disease, uh, you know, so just go with the pollen substitute. And uh, that's, you know, it's like a multivitamin. I mean, you know, nothing is going to take the place of eating a really good, healthy, balanced diet. But uh, having a multivitamin, or in this case, a pollen substitute, is certainly a close second to make sure that you're not uh, depriving your bees of natural or needed nutrition for wintering. Um, really, that's kind of the, um, uh, before we get to the question, one other thing that is kind of a common question, uh, yellow jackets, robbing as well, bees robbing. As a general rule, if your bees, uh, as long, 
we've got some boxes, <laughs> some boxes and yards that desperately need to be replaced. It's on the to-do list for next spring because I mean, like there's there's holes in them and everything. Um, if your colony or if your bee equipment is in good shape and you've just got the main front entrance, the bees, if they've been healthy, if they are healthy, if you've been managing them right, they should be healthy enough to be able to uh, uh, protect themselves from yellow jackets, to protect themselves from other robbers. I know in our one yard, we currently have about 200 and some colonies in the one yard. And there's two or three colonies, we just fed them all here a day or so ago. There's two or three colonies that got robbed out. And the reason they got robbed out was because the queen was rejected. Uh, there was already serious issues that had compromised the colony health, but all of the other colonies have a good population of bees at the front of the entrance, just waiting for trouble. <laughs> and they are, they're doing a really good job of guarding their goods. Um, so that's, that's kind of the thing. I mean, it certainly doesn't hurt to put up yellow jacket traps uh, try to trap the queens, trap, I mean, the less hornets and yellow jackets around your bees, the better. So, I mean, that, that certainly doesn't hurt to do. But once again, the main thing is to make sure that you're managing your bees uh, properly so that they have the health and the longevity to maintain and protect themselves. Uh, the other thing is that uh, there's a lot of questions about how do you set your hives up for winter? It's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, here I'm, I'm gonna try my, my hand at technology and see if I can't uh, show you a couple of pictures here. Well, actually, before I, uh, these are a couple other good things I can touch on. Are you all, uh, is, this, is, this, is this helpful so far? Is this helpful so far? Okay. I, uh, I, Believe it or not, I worked in radio for years, but I still get tired of hearing myself talk. But as long as you guys are, are getting good, good quality information out of this. Something that I, I just went to the home screen of my computer and uh, I thought I really should touch on this too. Let me see if I can share this. Um, let's see here. A couple of issues that you may be coming across. Okay, that's Varroa. Um, I know we have it in a couple of our, or a couple, in a few of our hives when we were calling them two or three weeks ago. And that is if you're seeing drone layers, which this is the brood, this is how the brood looks like with a drone layer, that could be a worker, uh, it could be a queen that's just not mated properly or she's run out of sperm, she's at the end of her life cycle, uh, you know, whatever the case. The result is brood that looks like this, because drone brood obviously comes from eggs that have not been fertilized. And so that's why when you have a laying worker, you get drone brood as well. Um, if you're seeing that this time of the year, the best thing to do is just shake those bees out, pack up those frames, those boxes, store them, set them aside. You can use them next year. Um, a hive that has that this time of year, you're not going to be able to salvage. Uh, to be quite candid with you, when a, when a colony has started at drone lane, it's pretty, especially if it's worker lane, it's pretty hard to bring that colony back. Uh, there was one guy who told me he was having success with giving them a queen cell, which I can see that working, but for our operation and for efficiency, uh, nine times out of 10, it's just best shake those bees out. And another word of caution, when you shake those bees out, um, shake them away from the apiary, or try not to shake them directly in front of any of your other hives. Because if you have a really large drone laying colony with laying workers and you shake them and the colony right next to where they were, is kind of a weaker colony, uh, it's not uncommon for those bees to go into that colony and kill the queen <laughs> and start the process of laying workers all over again. So um, just want to, when you shake the bees, kind of try to shake them away and uh, they'll, they'll, they'll still try to navigate back to where their old colony was. But 
there's less of a chance of them uh, taking advantage of, uh, of a weaker colony. Here's another thing that you may be seeing or is pretty common uh, in the spring and in the fall. Whenever you have stressors arise, as chalk brood uh, looks like this. There was a picture, I believe, that he had of uh, what the little mummies, what the little mummies look like in the entrance of the uh, of the hive. Before I get to this picture here, chalk brood again this time of the year. Um, if the colony looks really strong, if there's a good population of bees, they might be able to fight it. They might be able to work their way through it. But as a general rule, especially in the beginning of the year, if you have a colony that has chalk brood like that, uh, if there's still a good population of bees, it's good to just pinch the queen, find the queen, kill her, and requeen them. Because it's a, it's a, genetic, it's a genetic issue, and most, uh, most colony, or if you have a queen with a good genetics, a good background, uh, they're going to have a resistance to chalk brood. And so if you see chalk brood, it's just best to get those genetics out of your, out of your colony, out of your apiary. Uh, once again, if you're seeing a hive like that this time of the year and they're weaker, it's probably best just find the queen killer and then shake the rest of those bees out. Uh, last picture I'll talk about. I mean, we could, this is a whole topic or a whole evening of discussion in of itself, but you do not want to see bees like this. That is deformed wing virus. Um, if you see bees that, uh, that look like that, yeah, this is not normal here. Go figure. <laughs> Go figure. Um, you're going to have issues. It almost even looks like there might be a mite right where that arrow is pointing. But uh, anyways, you know, just coming back to the mite thing is that if you are visually seeing mites on your bees, that is not good. Uh, you do not want to see that. Uh, your your mite uh, your mite threshold has probably gotten way beyond what might even be salvageable for that colony. So just be proactive on that. Um, well, uh, any other questions? We'll kind of deal with that as uh, things come up. Hey, Susan, Lewis website is yeah, Lewis County Beekeepers website. Uh, great group of guys and girls, people folks, <laughs> really great group of people, uh, lewiscountybeekeepers.org. And Dan, we don't want to quote Dan. Dan doesn't know what he's doing. Dan is a really good friend, great guy. He's out in Aetna. And uh, he, him and I talk a lot and uh, share concerns with each other. And uh, I guess 10 things you can do. So, so I'm taking it. There's a slideshow of Dan's presentation and uh, Kevin Reichert. Kevin's another guy, you know, he's okay. You know, Susan puts up with him and Susan, my hat's off to you. you know. We'll see We'll see if I actually get the chance to supply nukes to the club this next year after this conversation. Anyways, okay, so let's get to some of the questions that were mailed, emailed in. Nancy Fisher. Hi again, Kevin. I thought of another question while debating about sugar in cash and carry in Olympia yesterday. I have heard that it's better to give bees cane sugar rather than beet sugar. Sucrose is sucrose, right? I bought the cane sugar, even though it costs $10 more for 50 pounds. Does it matter? That's a really excellent question. Um, it doesn't seem to. The only time where we seem to have uh, issues as far as the difference between beet sugar or cane sugar affecting bee health. And this is, this is hearsay. I mean, it's hearsay from what I would say is reputable sources. I haven't seen this myself. Um, the only problems we run into is if we're using sugar that is partially unrefined. So in other words, like a golden sugar or any kind of sugar that still has molasses in it then you can run into issues as far as um, uh, it affecting bee health. Uh, cane sugar being superior to beet sugar uh, if you're feeding them a partially unrefined sugar. But key takeaway, you don't want to feed them unrefined sugar of any type. White sugar, white sugar, white sugar. 
uh, sucrose is definitely the way to go. And so thanks for that, that question, Nancy. Second, or, let's see here. Angela writes in, I'm in Rainier. In the spring, I noticed there was no bees in my hives. I had left all the honey in the hives as I have no chance to harvest. I broke my leg in the spring and since the hive was empty, I did not make it a priority to harvest any honey or clean out the hives. There's been no activity all summer until a few days ago when I noticed that honey bees were swarming the hive. My question is, would these be the same bees that left the hive before? Do they return back to previous hives? What do I need to do now to ensure they will be fine all winter? First of all, hope your leg is feeling better. Um, there was another person too, we'll, we'll probably come across it in my little pile of questions here that asked the same. If your colony died earlier in the year and you're seeing bees swarming around it now, most likely they're robbing. Um, it's pretty spectacular. I'm actually, uh, our YouTube channel, if you haven't looked it up, High Five Bees, youtube.com forward slash High Five Bees. Uh, we really try to provide a, a regular educational video resource there, at least weekly. Um, I'm wanting to upload this uh, slow-mo video that I had of bees robbing. And I mean, you would think by looking at it that, that a massive colony of bees had moved into the boxes, but they were just robbing out the honey. Like I said, we've got over 200 colonies in our home yard. And uh, which, by the way, try to avoid doing that if you're wanting to extract on the same yard and do not have a place that's bee tight. It can get very interesting as the couple who helps me found out. They got run out of the extracting room more than a few times, not because the bees were aggressive, but just because, I mean, it, if you've never seen robbing before, it's a spectacular thing. And so it's probably robbing. You can crack the hive open and just see what, uh, you know, see what's going on. I mean, the way that you can identify robbing, bees that are robbers act kind of like how you'd expect a robber human being to act. Uh, they're very flighty. They're very quick and jerky in movement. Uh, they're very flighty. Uh, if you go up to a box that has robber bees and you just kind of knock on the box, uh, they'll be like a cloud of bees just, just lift out of the box. Uh, they know that, uh, that they're not supposed to be there. Uh, they are in a hurry. And uh, so they're very, just very chaotic in their behavior. Let's see, okay. Robert and Pamela, question. How do you deal with winter ventilation when using foam bubble layer? That's referring to what I've done in the past of using like that that it, it looks kind of like space blanket. Uh, they use it to wrap hot water uh, heaters and everything else is that uh, it looks like aluminum, but it's a bubble wrap insulation that you can get. I'll put those on top of the colonies a lot of time. Anyway, uh, what are the drawbacks of wintering single deeps over double? Okay, there's a lot of good questions here. Ventilation. Here is a really important topic and that's kind of, that's definitely a common, common question to come up. So let's see here. There was a slide that I had on this. Now let me see if I can find it. What we do for our bees is, uh, and this is the same principle that you can use whether you're wintering in a single or a double, is we have a half inch or three quarter inch hole that we drill right above the handhold of the super. We do that almost on every one of our deep boxes. The deep boxes that don't have that hole is because we've missed doing it. Um, so in a double deep, they'll actually have two upper entrances. Uh, so we have that uh, half inch to three quarter inch hole, usually a half inch hole that we have right above the handhold of the super on the front face of the, of the super. That has been sufficient uh, ventilation for us. The, uh, 
the uh, uh, the foam bubble wrap that we put on top of that is just to help reflect it down any of the heat that the colony may be losing just as the heat rises. But that has been sufficient. And you know, people have asked me too about ventilation for uh, for colonies or, or or insulation rather for colonies. And let me see if I can share this with you because this is Michael Palmer, who is an absolutely incredible resource. If you go on YouTube, um, really nice guy too. Uh, if you can kind of see here, I'll just I'll just play this video. If you see his colonies, this is in northern Vermont, where it was kind of similar to Manitoba, where I had bees where you can get down to negative 20 degrees, negative 30 degrees. And all he does is use tar paper or roofing paper just around the colonies. And the reasoning for that, uh, with my experience of wintering bees up in Canada, it makes total sense, is that if you put insulation around your hives, it's kind of a double-edged sword because it may help them keep their heat in, but when you get a sunny day or whatever else, uh, it also keeps the uh, the warmth of that sun from being able to penetrate into the hive. Obviously, in our area, sunny days during the winter is not exactly a normal thing. But if you want to use like a roofing paper around the hive as a windbreak, that's a great idea. And uh, as you can see too, more or less, I think it keeps his uh, entrances of his hives more or less wide open. Um, before we switched our bees to pallets and we just had them on regular bottom boards, we did the same thing. The only thing is, is we take half inch hardware cloth and cut a strip that was as wide as the entrance and then about maybe three inches wide and we'd fold it into a V and push that in the entrance as a mouse guard. But that seemed to provide really good airflow because you had the top entrance, as he has here, and then you also had the bottom entrance. So you had good airflow, good uh, good air movement. And so that's uh, that's really all you have to do. Uh, the The interesting thing is, one of the first years that I wintered my bees up in Canada, uh, the gentleman that I was wintering them with gave me these shallow supers that were filled with pine shavings. I didn't really see that that did anything more than having, having a, a, a foam, you know, that half inch foam insulation on top or, or what have you. The, um, if you've got even just a half inch or three quarter inch ventilation hole on right above the handhold of your super, that's usually ventilation enough. If you're using an inner cover, uh, that's actually even easier because you can just flip the inner cover over so that they have that top entrance. And you know, then you can throw a, a piece of half inch or one inch foam insulation on top of that inner cover and then put your metal uh, telescoping cover over that. But uh, it, it, it really doesn't have to be complicated. Don't, don't freak yourself out of thinking that it's this massive equation or formula of preparing your bees for winter. Uh, if you've nailed the mites, if you've got them fed up to a good weight within the next week, two weeks, uh, that is like 90, 95% of the battle at this point. Other things can go wrong. Um, queens die, weird things happen. But at this point, mite control and just making sure they've got that nutrition is really the biggest, biggest thing to do. Um, drawbacks of wintering single deeps over double deeps. Another really excellent question. I think it's management preference. Um, once again, this gentleman that I was talking to in North Dakota, they truck their bee, they have their bees up in North Dakota for the uh, summer for honey production and then they truck their bees back down to um, Texas for overwintering. And they break all their bees down to singles for ease of management and transportation. Um, I know people up in Canada in really cold climates that successfully winter in singles. Um, for me personally, I like doubles because I like 
I like being able to get their weight up to a, uh, a good weight, let them have that top second box, have a good, good amount of uh, resources in their nectar pollen, so that when we're taking them down to uh, California, our year down there, it begins around the beginning of January, we give them pollen sub then, and they're able to use all of that extra weight and convert that into brood. Same principle though, even for bees that I'm leaving up here over the winter, I still, I just prefer seconds. And I think it really is personal preference on how you want to manage your bees. Um, reduced entrances during winter months. It's probably best to have a, a completely open entrance once again for airflow, but you also want to make sure that uh, you have some way of keeping mice out of the hive when you do that. Leah asks, what do you do with supers that are only partially capped off if you want to remove them to condense the hive for winter and treat for mites? I actually had a couple other people ask that same question too. Um, if you're extracting the honey for yourself, for your neighbors, for your friends, by this time of the year, the moisture content of any uncapped honey should be about as low as it can get. And so I wouldn't worry about it. I would just go ahead and pull those. Um, the issue that arises for beekeepers who are wanting to resell their honey, um, what, what some beekeepers who are very unscrupulous, I guess would be the word, will try to do is they'll try to extract, it's, I, I don't think it's really that common, but they'll try to extract green nectar or, or unripened nectar because it takes up a greater volume because the moisture content still hasn't been broken down to the, around that 14, 17 percent uh, moisture content threshold that you need for honey to keep and not ferment. And so guys will try to extract the volume out so that they're getting more volume and that obviously compromises the quality of the honey and uh, you can have your honey ferment, things like that. But at this time of the year, I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, if you're really concerned about the uncapped frames, you can set them aside uh, in a place where mice can't get to them. I mean, put them in a, you could put them in a, uh, in a garbage bag or a trash bag, put them in your freezer and save them for the spring. You know, if you want to need to do some emergency feeding to some hives that have become light, you can do that. But uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, it's like for us, we sacrificed some honey production this year so we could get out there early and treat the mites. Um, I would much rather do that and save a colony that's going to make me $200 in almond pollination. I'll sacrifice $20 of honey, if that, uh, to get those mites under control. Roberta, why shouldn't we use oxalic acid now? What is a good pollen patty and should we feed now? Uh, we kind of addressed that last question already. Oxalic acid is, there's no question that it's effective. And I think a fair amount of you know that I had a bad experience with it three years ago. It's not the oxalic acid's fault. Um, and if I communicated that, uh, I, I want to apologize for it because oxalic acid has a long history of being effective at killing mites. <clears throat> The reason I shy away from using it this time of the year and why I would recommend not relying upon it this time of the year is that in our milder temperatures here, we still have a lot of brood present. And uh, I was just reading a, uh, it's actually in that Russian honeybee, Russian honeybee book. Uh, they reiterate that using oxalic acid when you have a lot of brood present just is not effective because the oxalic crystals that form if you're vaporizing it, or even the oxalic crystals that form if you're using a drip or dribble method, um, I think on average last, I think it's like a day or two days, maybe three days tops. And so the, uh, the last time I checked your, for oxalic acid, I think the treatment was what every, once every five to seven days, three times or four times or whatever. 
if you do the math of how active those crystals stay in a colony to kill mites, and you've got all of this cat brood, there's a lot of holes for the mites to, uh, for the mites that are still in the cat brood to miss those auxilic treatments. So what I've started doing, what I did last year, what I'm planning on doing this year, is around this time of the year where we have heavy brood, we're still using a treatment that's going to be active for, between the treatment cycles. Um, or in the case of Apivar, uh, you're supposed to have this consistent release of Amitraz over, I believe it's 40, you know, 42 days. Um, so it, it covers a whole brood cycle and then some. What we're going to do is probably in December, maybe the beginning of December, when we get a milder day, like in the 50s, where the bees, where the cluster is broken apart enough that auxilic vapors can penetrate, permeate those bees efficiently, we're gonna go out and do an oxalic acid treatment uh, because cap brood is gonna be at a minimum. The vast majority of the mites are going to be external and then oxalic acid uh, has a great track record. When it touches a mite, it kills it. But this time of the year, it's not, it's not a treatment I would depend upon. Um, there was one guy who I have no doubt was I don't believe he was exaggerating, who told me he was having success treating with oxalic acid this time of the year by doing a treatment every three days, 10 times. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, I don't have the time to do that. Um, oxalic acid's great for how cheap it is, but I, I don't have the time to do something that, that intense. So anyway, Let's see here, next question. Kathy, here's my question. Resource for supplementing pollen for winter bee health and how to feed it. Once again, I would check out, uh, check out our local bee suppliers, uh, Woods Bee Company, uh, Bee Line, Woodenware and Apiary. Uh, then of course you have Man Lake, you have Dayton, you've got, uh, oh gosh. I, anyways, those are the top ones that come to the top of my mind. And then as far as for uh, pollen sub, when you're feeding pollen sub, you want to make sure that it's as close to the cluster of bees as possible. Uh, bees don't like to carry pollen sub from far corners of the hive. So if you're wintering in doubles, like what we do, uh, we take a piece of wax paper, because our, our pollen sub comes in bulk. We take a piece of wax paper or a deli paper, uh, the, the, or sandwich paper, the really, the really uh, thin wax paper. It's, it's like a tissue. Put that down, put the pollen sub on it, put the second box back on it, and that's perfect because, I mean, it's putting it right in the center of their brood. Uh, if you're wintering in a single, uh, you just put it right on top of the cluster. Uh, once again, it's a really good idea that um, most pollen patties that you buy will be between wax paper, but just in case it isn't, the reason you put that wax paper is that the heat of the colony, depending on the formulation of the pollen sub, can cause that pollen sub to start to melt between the frames. And if that melts onto any open brood, uh, it'll suffocate, it'll kill it. So that's why you wanna have that wax paper. Uh, Heather asks, after treating for mites, how long do you need to wait before harvesting for honey? It depends on the treatment that you use. Um, hops guard, along with uh, mite away quick strips, you can use while there's honey. Pre better, better, set, better double check on the hops guard. I'm second guessing myself on that. I know mite away quick strips you can use uh, when uh, uh, honey supers are present. For the most part though, I would just always try to schedule your treatment in a way that uh, minimizes any contact with any honey that's gonna have any kind of human consumption. Uh, it's just, I remember one year I treated with formic acid and had honey supers present and I could, it might've been my imagination, but I swear I could taste it. <laughs> I swear I could taste, taste that acidity. And so I just thought, you know, it just, um, you do a treatment in the spring for mites 
and then once again, just pull your honey supers um, uh, as early as you can to get treatment. There's some people who've asked me who are going after like fireweed, uh, fireweed in higher elevations, as far as I know, might even still be blooming. Goldenrod, I don't know if their goldenrod is really that common. I, I think I've seen it here, but it's not that common. Um, you, ideally, you want to just treat the beginning of August. Um, as we said in the beginning, if you haven't treated yet, uh, there may still be time. Go treat now, just get it done, get it over with. But uh, the biggest thing I would just avoid, try to avoid having any kind of uh, honey that's going to be for human consumption to come into contact with any kind of treatment, uh, natural, synthetic, whatever. I, I just try to avoid that. Do I have a tried and true recipe for pollen patties? I do not. Uh, a person, though, that's local here that has great success with her honeybees and that I would trust what she, is, uh, uh, what she has discovered. She's a very smart woman and has done a lot of research in what she does is Lori Miller. Lori Miller in Roy, Roy, Washington. Uh, she has her Facebook page, uh, Miller Compound and Bees, I believe is the name of it. And she has a pollen recipe, a uh, pollen substitute recipe that she uses. And she's got great bees. I mean, uh, she consistently, too. It's been consistent. And so I would uh, go over to her, uh, her web page, her Facebook page. Um, com I believe it's Miller Compound and honeybees. Lori Miller out of Roy, Roy Washington. Uh, I treated my bees. This is from Michael. I treated my bees with Apivar first part of July and will be taking them out in six weeks in mid-September. Should I install Mitaway strips when I take the Apivar strips out? I'm concerned about disturbing the hive with cooler temps in the end of October, beginning of November. I would suggest, Michael, that you do a alcohol alcohol wash or a, a sticky board check for what your current mite load is after that apivar treatment you don't want to treat your bees unnecessarily um, but and the reason i recommend alcohol wash is it's more accurate you can do a uh, powdered sugar wash of where <laughs> it's kind of humorous you know where you put half a cup of bees uh, with uh, powdered sugar and you shake them for a minute or roll them. You don't have to actually shake them. You can roll them. And uh, the bees will actually uh, groom a lot of the mites off of themselves. And then once those bees fly away, you can just put a few drops of water uh, in that sugar, which will make it become uh, lucid and you can see the mites or any mites that have come off. It's not as accurate as an alcohol wash. And, and once again, I mean, we lost over 90% of our stock three or four years ago um, due to mites. And so I am super paranoid about making sure I'm very accurate in knowing what my mite counts are doing. Uh, Robert sent me a message. What about bringing bees inside a well-ventilated building for the winter or well-vented. So we used to winter our bees inside. Uh, they would, uh, Ian, um, what's his last name? He's on YouTube, really nice guy. Uh, the name of his YouTube channel, a, a Canadian beekeeper's blog. Is it Ian, uh, I can't remember his last name. Anyways, YouTube, uh, Canadian beekeeper's blog. He's got videos on it. He is in the same province that we kept bees uh, of wintering bees indoors. You just have to make sure that it's absolutely pitch, pitch dark, pitch black, so the bees don't fly out of the hive. And you really need to make sure that they've got good ventilation because bees, like human beings, generate carbon dioxide. And if you don't have good ventilation, they can suffocate themselves. So yeah, no, that, that's definitely possible. There's actually guys out in uh, Eastern Washington Eric Olson was one of the uh, first ones, Olson's Honey Farm. It's now Shakespeare Honey Farm out of, uh, oh, it's by Yakima. Actually pioneered the whole idea of putting his bees in the sheds that they use for keeping produce cool. 
and wintering his bees in there. And uh, anyways, yeah, that's a whole other discussion too. So yeah, no, it is possible. Just good ventilation needs to be pitch black. And I would just say research it so you have more of the details of like the temperature you want to keep it at and what have you. Uh, Roberta asks, can you take honey out of your hive before treatment's done for mites and put it somewhere so if you don't end up feeding it to your bees over winter, you can still harvest and eat it? I, I would say probably the best thing to do if you have the space for it is freeze, freeze it. Uh, that kills any wax moths. Um, you can freeze a frame of honey and uh, you, know, you don't need it extract it or I mean you can even just throw it in the freezer for a couple of days to make sure all the mites or uh, rather wax moth larva or eggs are killed and then uh, keep it just in a secure I don't know I mean I've kept honey frames like that not for not for human consumption though for feeding just put them in boxes and make sure you have good uh, lids on top so mice can't get into it and you can do that. Uh, personally, for me, I like to get the honey that's going to be used for human consumption, for packaging. Get it out of the hive as soon as you can, as soon as it's ready, and get it bottled so that it's uh, not just sitting around or what have you. It just, to me, it just doesn't seem right to do that for resale. I mean, for yourself, I mean, obviously, that, that's your preference. Stet asks, where can we obtain pollen and how much should we feed? My bees never put honey into the top super. I'm feeding heavy sugar solution. Does that sound like a good preparation for winter? I assume there isn't much honey production going on now. Thank you, that's my question. So once again, with pollen substitute, by me, my nose is itchy. Maybe it's COVID, no, no, I'm just kidding, just kidding. Uh, for me, I would say that probably, you know, if you give them a patty or two patties this time of the year, that should be fine. Um, especially if you're overwintering them here, we're being way more aggressive because once again, our season's gonna start in January. But, uh, you know, so give them a couple of pounds, two or three pounds isn't a bad idea this time of the year. And maybe even give them another two or three pounds uh, around the end of September just once again to make sure they have that protein resource and nutrition resource uh, for those bees hatching that are gonna make up the winter cluster. You wanna make sure that those bees are fat. And I reference you back to Randy Oliver's website and those articles on fat bees, the importance of them. Yeah, feeding the heavy syrup solutions, definitely what you need to be doing. And you may even find that uh, the bees start filling out some of those some of the foundation that they may have missed being stimulated by that syrup. Daniel writes, last year I believe my hives died from mildew or mold. What can I do to avoid this? Once again, a lot of times moisture, if, if you're having a lot of moisture issues with your colony, one of two things or both, uh, look at your ventilation. Do you have top ventilation? You need top ventilation. Along with that, it's good to have your bottom entrance wide open. Just make sure that you have something that keeps mice out. And then the other thing is, is make sure that you're giving them adequate time to cure any nectar or syrup that you're feeding them so that they get the moisture out of it. Um, that's actually a, Ian, who I was just mentioning, who has the uh, Canadian Beekeepers blog actually has a video of moisture coming out of some of the hives that he's wintering inside from exactly that. Um, they had a cold snap, which happens in Canada, happens here. They had a cold snap, I think it was in September, and, uh, and it just stayed cold. And so the bees didn't have time to properly prepare that syrup. So that's why you wanna get your bees this, this window of good weather that we're having is crucial to take advantage of to make sure that the bees have the chance to uh, properly cure that syrup. Uh, Darlene, I know this is about wintering, but if you have a moment, my question is about a honey harvest. Is there a way to get the bees to cap their honey? I have uncapped honey. Okay, so actually this is what we were just talking about. Uh, 
So I finally pulled it off the middle of August. The honey was thick and I tried to shake it out, but it would not come out. It was like they just stopped working. I'm pretty sure the honey was good for harvest. I tried fallen patties, a week of sugar water, put in drawn frames, hoping they would condense their work to the frames I wanted them to finish. Is there any secret tricks? Also, can you elaborate more on mite control? Uh, I'm usually using oxalic acid, but just happened to be using a different mite control this year. Formic Pro strips, but I hate to crack open the brood box this time of year. So once again, don't worry about uh, honey that's not capped off, especially if you're using it for yourself, you're gonna give it away as, as family, family friends. Uh, just pull it off, get that mite treatment done. Um, I really wouldn't worry about, uh, I wouldn't worry about them drying out foundation in any of those honey supers. Now is the time to have them focus on the single or the double deep that you're going to be wintering in and focus them on building that out. And if you have foundation that's not totally drawn out, when you're feeding them that syrup, uh, chances are good that's going to stimulate them to draw that out so that they have the space to store what they need for successful wintering. Wendell asked, hey, you guys all doing still good, by the way? Is this, is this being helpful? I'm enjoying that. I, I'm, I'm really, um, a major frustration for me, obviously nuke sales make up a, a pretty good percentage of our business. And I hate, I absolutely, I love selling nukes, but I absolutely hate selling nukes to the same people over and over again, seeing the discouragement in their eyes of wondering why their bees died. I, for me, um, I would much rather a person say, hey, you know what, I bought bees from you five years ago and ha ha ha, I haven't had to buy any more because they're taking off. I mean, to me, <laughs> that would make my day. And so that's where, you know, I'm wanting to provide more and more resources like this into next year and also through the YouTube channel. Uh, it's a never ending process of learning. And that, that, if I can just reiterate that, you just need to continually be learning about your bees. Um, if you go into beekeeping, and I, I don't discourage people that, that want to do this. I mean, you know, there's people who come up to me and say, hey, you know what, we just want to have a, have a hive and, and just leave it in our yard. And I'll tell them, what I'm telling you in the sense of that you need to actively manage it or what have you. But I'm thrilled that there's so many people interested in honeybees. Uh, I mean, what a great time for our industry. What a great time for pollinators. What a great time that uh, so much attention is being put on these incredible insects. And so, yeah, anyways, that's kind of my little, got off on a rabbit trail there. Wendell, here's my question. I made a mistake this spring. I have three colonies all bought from you. My mistake was putting a third deep on two colonies. How, when do I take them back to two deeps? There is a guy in Indiana, and now my, my uh, mind's gonna go blank on his name. He just had a birthday too. I wished him happy birthday on Facebook and I can't remember his name. Anyways, there's a guy in Indiana who swears by wintering bees in three deeps. And that's actually why I kind of experimented this year with letting them bring some of their own honey into the second deep, and we didn't extract that, is because his point is, is that, sure, okay, you know, you say you put a third deep on your bees and you don't extract it, and that's, if it's a deep, that could be, in our area, this would be unusual, but in his area, you know, that could be 50, 60 pounds of honey in that, in that deep. But what he has shown, and when you look at, I wish I could remember his name, maybe it'll come to me yet. You look at videos of his bees, his whole point is, is that in the spring, them having that extra honey, they just take off like gangbusters. And this guy will have hives that, you know, during the honey flow will be eight or nine supers high. Once again, different region, different part of the country, they have a heavier flow. But it's kind of interesting to toy with that and think, okay, you know, syrup, <laughs> syrup versus honey, what you think is gonna be nutritionally superior, 
all thing, el everything else being equal. I mean, it's, it's going to be the syrup, or I mean the uh, honey, rather. Um, so if you're wanting to pull that honey, though, there's nothing wrong with pulling it now. Um, even uh, when we take all of our boxes, all our honey supers off and break them down into two colonies, two deeps, a lot of times there'll be a ton of bees bearded in the entrance because they don't have room. They don't have anywhere to go. Um, but it's, it's fine. It, it, it's not nothing to be worried about, nothing to be concerned about. Okay, let's see here. Got a few couple more here and then uh, we'll take a few minutes if, for those of you if you want to ask a question here uh, in the uh, chat. Nancy writes, could you please go into more detail about oxalic vapor? You have had bad luck with it in the past. Could you please tell that story again? Why shouldn't I be using it now? Brood load? Also, I'm using, we, we kind of touched on that already, but she says, I'm using APA Life Var. It's recommended every week for four weeks in a row. Do you agree? Does this treatment hurt the honey for the bees? So I actually uh, pre-read this question and had to look, because I'd heard of APA, what is it, APA Life Var before, but I couldn't remember what it was. Um, it's a mixture of thiamol, eucalyptus, and a couple of other things. I, from what I'm seeing, it looks like it could be a good, uh, a good thing to try. Um, you know, once again, use those sticky boards. If you don't have actual sticky boards like the fancy grid pattern ones, you can use a manila folder, uh, like, you know, office folder and uh, cut that to size so it fits in your bottom board or on your bottom board and just put a thin coating of Crisco shortening on it. Same thing, you know, slide that in, uh, put on this APA Life Bar and come back, pull that, uh, don't pull the treatment, follow the instructions of whatever it says to do with that, but pull the uh, sticky board after 48 hours, see what your mic drop is. Um, I don't have any experience with it. I think it's a new product that sort of came on the market here in the last year or so. Um, but I mean, I, I don't know. I, that'd be something might be worth a try. Uh, we're actually talking about Bo and Chris who have started working with me and have brought a lot of sanity to my life. We're actually telling me that next year we should look at having an experimental apiary uh, where we experiment with just different treatment options and just kind of see see what that looks like. And, you know, that would be kind of one I'd be sort of curious to see what the effectiveness is. Um, okay, so I will respect the privacy because he sent me this privately. But he says, I mainly buy from you to build up my yard, plus your bees are the best. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. It's, you know what, I mean, I, I'm very proud of our nukes, but anyone who has been in beekeeping any period of time, it is humbling. Um, our bees this year look better than what I have seen them in ages, if ever. But as I was talking to this, this friend of mine in uh, North Dakota, North Dakota, Texas, is where he operates between, I told him, I said, that actually makes me more nervous because the stronger your colonies are, oftentimes the more viral issues or diseases can propagate. And so it's, it's this thing of uh, my bees look better now than they ever have been. But at the same time, I am still going to be very, very diligent and I am not going to get on any soapbox because a new viral issue could come out over the winter that we've never seen before. The Asian hornet carrying COVID could come in and sting us all. You know, I mean, it's 2020, you know, anything's possible. No, so, I mean, you just have to be continually diligent. And, um, you know, for me, this is going on 22 years now of beekeeping. And I, I know a lot, but I use that as a, as an illustration to say that all that I know currently highlights still that there's still so much more to learn and to keep on top of. So anyway, so that kind of wraps up. Uh, I think that's all of the, oh, here, oh, one, one other question here. Uh, 
I didn't get the gentleman's name. What are your pre and post treatment mite loads? I am seeing tremendous variation in mite loads depending on which and when the frames are pulled. Yes. This was a weird year in that I had a tremendous amount of uncapped honey in the hives till now. I am reluctant to treat with anything. I'm reluctant to treat anything with anything when uncapped honey is present. Should I treat and remove treatments if there is a honey flow? It's really tough to meet the requirements of temperature and time in a hive, i.e. six weeks and catch the mites before they take off. Totally. Uh, lastly, finally, I'm having a very positive result with insulating the hives with two inches of styrofoam all around. I use the two inch pink foam sold by Home Depot, no moisture issues. What is your experience with wrapping? I appreciate your distinction advice between the commercial and the craftsman beekeepers. Um, once again, I, I recommend against insulating around the hive. But at the same time, if you're insulating around your hives and you're having great success with it, keep doing it. Don't mess with the machine. Um, but personally, I found it, it, the best thing is just to insulate on the top. And that really is taking care of any moisture issues that we've had for bees that were wintering here. Um, what are your pre and post treatment mite loads? So I look at mites kind of the same way as dealing with a, I hate to use this analogy, but it's perfect. Kind of as a viral or a bacterial outbreak in the sense that in an ideal setting, the best way to deal with an infection is to isolate it and do a mass treatment. Um, so if you've got, say, say you have two colonies, if one is showing really, really serious mite load and the other not so much, I still think it is absolutely wise and I would treat both of them due to the fact that, you know, there's, the jury is still out on exactly how mites transport themselves. But one thing is clear is they're very good at doing that and from hopping from B to B, however they do that. And so um, even if you have colonies that don't seem to have mites, but you have some that just treat, treat them all, treat them all and treat them all at the same time so that you isolate those mites, you don't give them any chance or any place to go. The treatment threshold at this point, if you're doing an alcohol wash, um, is anything over two, absolutely for three, but really anything over two mites per hundred bees. So when you're doing an alcohol wash, when you're doing a uh, sugar powder roll or wash, uh, using powdered sugar, you're using half a cup of bees and half a cup of bees roughly translates to 300 bees. So whatever mites you're left with, you divide that by three and anything over two, but absolutely three, for us it's anything over two mites per 100 bees, uh, we will treat. Um, but we're also, the way that we run our operation is that we have treatment periods that are just kind of non-negotiable. Uh, as soon as we bring our bees back from California, from the almonds, we treat them. I mean, they've been down there with three and a half million other hives or however many hives it is they bring there. They're going to have mites. I mean, there's, there's just no doubt about it. Uh, and then right at the end of the honey flow, we treat again. This third treatment that we're doing is... Uh, negotiable. It depends upon what we're seeing mite load wise. So alcohol wash is the best thing. Don't depend on sticky boards for, um, uh, for mite threshold treatments as much because they're not as specific. Um, like even that, that uh, sticky board that I showed you, I'm treating, that's a sample off of all of the bees, I guess. Um, but I doubt it because even within 48 hours, I can guarantee you not all the bees that are on all the, or all the mites that are on all the bees have dropped. And so it's much better to do a specific alcohol wash 
as your controlled way of monitoring Varroa. We use the sticky board kind of as a just overarching, let's see where the colony is. If we're seeing more than 25, 30 mites on that sticky board after 48 hours, uh, we're probably gonna want to treat again. But alcohol wash, uh, the uh, powdered sugar wash, anything over three mites per 100, you definitely want to treat, but it's probably a good idea two mites per 100. Uh, that wraps up the questions that were sent to me beforehand. Um, take a couple of minutes here, we can take it to 7.30. Um, if anyone wants to type a question or, um, or even if you want to ask a question, uh, go ahead and unmute and, um, and ask away. Man, I'm that clear of a communicator. That's amazing. I do want to reiterate that uh, if, you, if you get a chance to go back to the email that you received, and just even in a sentence, highlight what could be better, what you liked about this, uh, because this is something we want to continue to improve and make good use of your time and really make sure that this is an educational resource for you and really helping you be successful in your beekeeping. Because I mean, there's, it can be overwhelming at times, but just realize that's kind of the nature of it. Um, it's typical to kill your bees the first year, second year, I killed mine, um, my first hive. I used to go out and check it two to three times a day and couldn't figure out why I had such aggressive bees. They, they just, they seemed to be really irritated that I was out there two or three times a day. Um, but no, my, my, the, my bees the first year, they didn't have a chance, man. I mean, I, I don't think mites or anything else killed them. I think I did just by harassing them all the time, trying to learn about them. And that's fine, you know, I mean, you got to get in there, learn about your bees. That's, that's all part of it. And uh, don't, uh, you know, don't worry about trying to get this thing perfect. Like I said, top of your notes, mites, 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 mites. And nutrition, um, that scientificbeekeeping.com is an absolutely incredible resource. Uh, he's got all of his articles. He's a monthly... Um, published, not publisher, uh, monthly contributor to the American Bee Journal. But about a month or so after his article in the journal has come out, he puts it on his website. So you can go back and I think back to 2009 or whatever in his articles. And they're, they're, they're incredible. They're absolutely wonderful. And I highly encourage you to do that. And, uh, but anyways... Cool, no, I, thank you, thank you, Steph, thank you, Robert, uh, Wendell. Um, uh, oh, and here, one quick question, Randy. Sorry, I just saw this. Will the bees move honey down into the brood area from supers? Yeah, they will, they will. Uh, as temperatures get cooler, they will do that. Um, bees, bees know what to do most of the time, <laughs> unless we incorporate systems that kind of throw off that natural part. But uh, yeah, they will. They'll uh, they'll draw that down into the uh, into the brood area, and uh, you shouldn't shouldn't really have to worry about it. Doesn't hurt to double check, uh, but just the big thing I would say at this point, Randy, is just make sure they've got good weight, and um, and if there does happen to be a distance between the super that has honey and where the cluster is, and there's empty space, uh, see if you can't remove a super get that honey store closer to them. A benefit of wintering here in our area is we get a fair amount of mild breaks in temperature throughout the winter that allows the cluster to move. Whereas up in Canada, I mean, oh my gosh, or even, you know, the Northern States, uh, Central, you know, uh, Northeast, I mean, you get two weeks, you get two weeks of, of, of uh, negative 20. And if the bees weren't in contact, if there wasn't solid contact of feed and resources for them to slowly creep to, uh, they could starve two, three inches away from stores that they had. So, yeah, that's kind of another thing. But uh, anyway, okay, no, cool. We'll uh, go ahead and wrap this up. And, uh, and thank you all. Thank you all so much again for your time and for participating.
and uh, we'll make sure that we do it again. You guys all have a great evening and uh, look forward to doing it again really, really soon. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Hey, thank you guys.